Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Conference and Trade Show uh, outside Washington, D.C. at National Harbor. And we have with us Tim McHugh, who is the Vice President for uh, LCS, LCS program. Programs at Austell. That's correct. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Um, obviously, one of the talks of the show is your uh, frigate variant uh, of the littoral combat ship. Um, you guys have already built eight of the four of the ships, uh, if I'm correct. So, so we've delivered LCS two, LCS four, LCS six, LCS eight, and LCS ten. It was December of last year. Right. We currently have LCS 12, 14, 16, 18, and 22 under construction. Um, an enormous amount of progress. You know, it's like, you, you know, on the LCS program, if you blink, you're missing a couple of hulls. So it's, it's uh, so I apologize for not having been totally up on that. But talk to us about the changes you're making to the ship. Obviously, the Navy is still working on what it's, um, obviously went through the big study a uh, um, couple of years ago. We decided that there was going to be a frigate variant. It's working on what it wants in the requirements for this frigate version of the ship or whether it's going to look at another potential alternative. But what are some of the ideas, you know, you're leaning forward in the saddle, what are the kind of capabilities that you'd like to outfit your ship with in order to give it that extra punch that the Navy is looking for? Sure, so we've been working closely with PMS 515, the Navy Program Office, um, for the last couple of years on funded studies, try to trade off capability versus cost. Um, the model you've seen here today has um, four of the objective capabilities that the Navy asked for. They wanted a strike missile, so we have 16 harpoon cells. Um, they wanted the ability to, to have a higher uh, electronic countermeasure, so we've, we've uh, arranged the most um, heavy, the biggest system. Um, they wanted the ability to support um, 130 people, a bigger crew than what's on the current LCS, when we have that, the provisions, the freezers. They also wanted the ability to go 4,300 nautical miles, and our propulsion plan allows us to do that. So there are other things we can do uh, on the model you, you probably have seen. We have VLS uh, arranged up on the 05 level, where the LCS currently has um, mission modules. We actually have integrated uh, VLS uh, for uh, surface-to-air missile uh, defense as well as ASRON. Um, some of the other changes that we offered were 30 millimeter gun down on the 01 level. Again, not yet a requirement. So we're trying to understand what the Navy values and then trade off cost versus capability to provide the most competitive offering. And um, one of the missions frigates have historically done is also anti-submarine warfare. You guys also have a variable depth sonar. Right. Um, and where you've kind of notched, you've reduced the size of the flight deck just a little bit in order to get that extra space for mounting that. And you also have a, have a towed array as well, correct? Uh, that's correct. So that was one of the big challenges we had. Do we notch the flight deck or not? We value our flight deck. Um, I think the Navy with the LCS will find an awful lot of things to do with a big flight deck. Uh, we, we just uh, were informed that Coronado, LCS-4, had done joint operation with an SH-60 helicopter and a fire scut at the same time in the South China Sea. Great capability. So we hesitated to notch the flight deck. When we went back to the Navy and said, what do you value more, a strike weapon or the large flight deck? They said, we like both, but in a priority standpoint, uh, we like the strike weapons more. So we notched the flight deck, uh, saved uh, 25 tons of weight, and then created a fantail aft that accommodates uh, quad, uh, two quad harpoon launchers, as well as the VDS you mentioned before. We don't know which VDS, variable that sonar it is yet, the competition's still going on, but again, we arranged the, the largest, heaviest that the Navy is contemplating on our ship. One of the things the Navy also wants um, out of its frigatized, uh, if you will, um, littoral combat ships is increased survivability. What are the, some of the things you're, you've been doing in order to try to get that increased survivability? You know, because we've addressed the lethality piece of it, but what about survivability? Yes, yeah, sure. So some of the requirements are for uh, more armor around the magazines, and we've arranged that into our ship. We've also gone to more grade A equipment, so our generators. Uh, we now have grade A generators across the board. LCS we wasn't required to be all grade A. Um, our ship went through shock trials last summer prove the structure. A lot of people were concerned about the structure for a trimaran, but we, we came through shock trials pretty well. Um, didn't have to do a whole bunch of modifications to the, to the whole form itself. Um, we have a lot of redundancy, so for independent shaft lines. We haven't modified the propulsion there very much, so it's pretty survivable already. Um, up on the uh, 05 level, up by the bridge, there's more armor uh, for small arms, Kevlar and, and other plate. Uh, again, the, the, the issue with a high-speed ship is you're trying to also keep an eye on weight. Right, so you trade off weight versus armoring. 
Uh, but those are some of the things we've done for survivability. Invariably, whenever you're adding that much weight, when, right, so you save 25 tons, but then you're putting 16 VLS tubes on it, you're putting 16 harpoon tubes on it, you're putting the two gun mounts, you're putting the high uh, capacity um, electronic warfare uh, on the ship, you put Nulka up topside as well, that all increases weight, changes your CG, your moment arms. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, how are your how, how that added weight is going to potentially affect the ship handling characteristics because you're also including f increasing fuel capacity and bunkerage. Right, so we're not changing the amount of tanks we have on board the ship. Uh, we have a trimaran. Um, the ship will get heavier. The displacement's long, uh, larger on the frigate. Um, the Navy has slowed down their requirement for speed. So instead of 40 knots, the top speed's about 32 knots. Um, again, the speed power curve drives you to, as you come down on the water, how fast can you go. So we can't go 40 knots with all the added weight, uh, but we can still meet the Navy's requirements, 32 plus. Um, we don't have to add extra tankage. We already have the range that they, they want. So, I, But does it change at all the ride quality, do you think, from the modeling that you've done? Is there going to be any change in the ride quality with the added weight, for example? Um, we, don't, we don't believe so. Again, it's a trimaran hull. Um, you'll, you'll pick up about eight inches of draft with the additional weight. Doesn't really impact uh, the ride control systems or how the ship goes through the water. You know, you were a surface warfare officer, uh, and you know, radiated noise was um, always always a challenge. When the Fig Sevens, the Tycho's, uh, the Spruans, you know, all of the gas turbine ships came in. There was Perrier, there were masker belts, there were uh, sound isolated machinery, and there were folks who look at both of the LCS designs with their super cavitating water jets and stuff and hard-mounted machinery and say, look, this thing is going to be radiating all sorts of noise into the water, which will um, compromise its ability to ever be an effective anti-submarine warfare platform. How do you, how do you respond to that as, as a retired surface warfare officer? So again, we've done studies on um, electric thrusters. Right now, the LCS has a hydraulic thruster forward, and it's noisy. There is no sound signature for LCS right now. But we have explored on our own um, the ability to go to an electric thruster, much quieter, increase your anti-submarine warfare figure of merit, right? So you think about it, you want to go compromise, you want to go uh, look for a submarine, you shut down the water jets, run on the electric thruster, you have much less noise coming out of the ship, makes your variable death sonar much more effective, makes all your other sensors more effective. The Navy hasn't made that a requirement yet. We've been pushing at that pretty hard to say, unless you make it a requirement, I'm not going to put it on my ship because it's going to increase the cost. Just this morning, one of the comments was, we need to revisit that. So it's, it's a good idea, that, and that's our job as a shipbuilder, is to offer alternatives to the Navy that best meets their requirements. The, the key for us is give me the requirements so I can then trade it off and give you the best package. Uh, do you think it would be a large cost driver for you to isolate that machinery from the hull and put it on rafts or put it on um, sort of elastomeric bearings and things like that in order to attenuate the sound from going into the hull and into the water? Um, it, it, it's just a matter of figuring out the foundation. We have resiliently mounted equipment on here right now. Um, the thruster is grade A shock right now. Uh, so it would just be a matter of um, uh, changing from diesel hydraulic to electric. Uh, and that would take most of the sound out of it. It's already mounted. What are the sort of lessons learned? Now that you've got five of these ships that are out there and you're gaining experience and gaining lessons on them, what are some of the lessons you've learned uh, on your design that's driving you to sort of think of, okay, you know, here, here are the things that are really, really great and we really like about it, but here are the things that we've got to keep working on it. Right, so in any ship, uh, the, the key to success is a learning curve, driving lessons learned ship to ship to make the construction uh, more efficient. Um, the first ship that went through our new facility, the module manufacturing facility, was LCS-8. Because we had already had a number of ships in construction already, in six-month centers, we really couldn't capture a lot of that learning, a lot of design change, until about LCS-14. Um, we went through a big effort with the production guys in the yard to say, what, what's killing you in terms of rework? What's killing you in terms of you know, tough spaces to work? And we made some design changes to allow it to be built more efficiently. And those are being rolled in ship to ship now. Um, some of them are um, no uh, transitions between plate thicknesses, right? Early on, for weight uh, reasons, uh, we were going you know, half millimeter changes in plate, which is ridiculous from a producibility standpoint. You want to keep it consistent if you can. There are some joint designs, weld joint designs, that require an awful lot of passes. We've been able to do extruded shapes in some of those areas now, uh, some of those high stress areas that don't require a whole bunch of welding. Um, the, the way we do accuracy control, especially after we have the water jets, uh, has been a challenge. Um, but once you do it and you get some repeatable processes and you have success, uh, you have much less rework. 
So shaft alignment, water jet alignment, all those things we've learned a lot on and are much better at it now than we were five years ago. And from the overall performance of the ship, you guys are satisfied with the performance you're seeing? Uh, performance from an operational standpoint or how we build the ship, or both? Operation. Uh, operationally, I think the Navy loves it. Um, you have to check with them. Um, I've been on the ship a number of times. I was on the final contract trials for LCS-8 about three weeks ago in San Diego uh, with the crew operating the ship. I brought some of my guys out to help if they needed it. The crew did a fabulous job doing full power, uh, surface detect to engage, air detect to engage. Uh, my guys handle some of the auxiliary equipment, the T-BEC, the, the crane, but now we're transitioning as we train the crew into operating those themselves. From my perspective, the crew was fabulous on LCS-8. And one of the challenges, or one of the, one of the big uh, topics of debate, obviously, was an aluminum ship. You know, whether or not there's going to be the endurance, the durability. Um, there are those who've said that, look, you know, depending on when you start work on an aluminum ship, if you start in the morning, you cut a hole, by noon the size of that hole changes. And there are folks who've said, look, from a Navy um, combat serviceability or just serviceability standpoint, that'll provide challenges. You know, how do you address those, those concerns in, um, in this vessel that has a lot of very, very positive attributes, but then again also has, you know, how do you address some of those challenges that, that, that you know, surface warfare officers look at and say, wow, you know, my hull tech can't just cut through a hull He's got to make sure that, you know, that does, there isn't deformation or expansion or contraction of the structure, for example. Sure. Any material is going to have its challenges. Um, aluminum is not necessarily the most familiar product to the Navy, although we've had aluminum deck houses for years. Um, uh, the Austell folks have learned an awful lot about shrinkage and uh, accuracy control. Um, you're right that um, thin plate will move uh, based on where you are doing it, but steel does the same. Right, so you have to figure out, no kidding, um, when you're taking it, control your environmental conditions, and then weld it up. We have the best welders in the world at aluminum. The Navy will pick up, as they get more of these in the fleet, the experience of operating uh, with the different welding techniques on aluminum. Uh, it's not rocket science. We have 200 of these vessels running around the world right now in the commercial side. So the commercial ferry guys understand. It, you maintain it, right? You're gonna have a crack prevention program. You can find the cracks, document them, and then take care of them. When you go into a dry dock, you fix the cracks. So it's a different medium than, than steel, not quite as forgiving, but when you have a high-speed ship, that's the trade-off that you have. You know, they don't build aircraft out of steel. Right? They build aircraft out of aluminum, and they deal with maintaining that metal. Right? Same thing that Navy's going to learn on how to do with this load, just like we have learned. Right, and, and steel ships have cracked too. So, I mean, that, you know, in, in you know, full honesty, right? Uh, and, and some of them have cracked in very, very horrible ways, um, ultimately. Um, what are some of the advantages? I mean, from your standpoint, what are some of the clear advantages of having an aluminum ship, you know, even in a highly corrosive saltwater environment? And so you look at the top side of our ship, there's no paint. Right? We paint uh, from the water line down to keep any kind of... Um, you know, growth uh, and make sure the ship goes through the water. But over lifetime, having an aluminum ship that doesn't require chipping hammers and new paint will save millions of dollars. If you look at what it costs for the life cycle of a ship, the biggest things are fuel and paint. You just eliminated all that from the top side of our ship for the life of the whole ship. What are bosun mates and everybody else going to do without chipping hammers, wire brushes, and, and gallons of red lead and paint? Well, they can operate the small boats, they can operate the t -back, and if they really want to chip paint, they go back in the flight deck make Navair happy. Now, let me, okay, wait a minute, this is what this is a personal beef issue. So why aren't you using a roughening technology on that that you guys had developed um, that, uh, that both INCAT had the same thing? Why are you putting non-skid on that surface if you can rough the aluminum in order to get the same non-skid properties? Check with Navair. Um, we have some very conservative tech warrant holders in both NAVC and Navair, and thus far they've asked for non-skid on the flight deck. Sir, thanks very much for your time, and we look forward to further updates on the program. Yeah, my pleasure. Nice to meet you.